Good evening, and welcome to the first installment of Descent Made Material, Dunstan Hall's Symposium for January and February. We are thrilled this evening to have Johanna Brown with us from Old Salem and the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. Welcome, Johanna. We're looking forward to hearing all about the Moravians. Thank you. I'm looking forward to sharing. If you were to travel to one of the museums in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, or Salem, North Carolina, that tell the stories of the Moravians in America, the term descent is probably not the first word that would come to mind. Tranquil, beautiful, organized, well-planned. These are the things that might pop into your mind, but not descent. And yet the Moravian church or the unity of the brethren as they called themselves was founded on descent. The name Moravian has been associated with the unity of the brethren because the seeds of the movement were sown in Bohemia and Moravia in what is now the Czech Republic in the 15th century, when the foremost Czech reformer within the Catholic Church, John Huss, was burned at the stake for his unrelenting opposition to many of the practices of the Catholic Church. The death of Huss set off a series of religious wars that disrupted Europe for decades. More than a century before Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the church door in Germany, in 1517. So the Moravians were really dissenters before Reformation was cooled. A small group of Huss's followers organized following his death and became known as the Unity of the Brethren. Although the followers were exiled and worshiped in secret for centuries. The 18th century saw the renewal of the Moravian Church or Unity of the Brethren through the patronage of Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf a Lutheran pietist <clears throat> nobleman in Saxony who gave sanctuary to a small group of refugee members of the church fleeing persecution in other parts of Europe. The refugees were in, were in search of a safe place to worship. And it just so happens that Zinzendorf was in search of a group of followers to fulfill his dream of forming ideal Christian communities. Here on Zinzendorf's estate, they founded a religious community called Herrenhut and watched over the rebirth of the unity of the brethren, or as we refer to it today, the Moravian church. It was in Herrenhut that the Moravians developed many of the unique practices and customs that set them apart from fellow Protestants. During the second quarter of the 18th century, Zinzendorf became the Moravians principal spiritual leader. Combining aspects of pietism, Orthodox Lutheranism, and German mysticism, Zinzendorf's theology embraced the belief that members of congregations could live together under a choir system, not singing choirs, this was organization of people, segregated by gender, age, and marital status. Because each member of the sect was expected to contribute to the spiritual and material well-being of the community, work was considered service to God. When planning settlements and towns from which to launch their missionary efforts, church leaders endeavored to promote crafts they deemed advantageous for their respective communities. These were just some of the distinctive characteristics the Moravians brought with them when they migrated to the American colonies. In Europe and America, the leadership of the church maintained tight control over the material and spiritual affairs of the communities. The first American settlement in Georgia in 1735 failed, but the second in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania did quite well as a theocratic settlement in which the church controlled all things spiritual and secular. The Moravians living in Pennsylvania quickly developed a reputation as responsible, industrious um, colonists in spite of their unusual community organization. And I'll describe that a little bit more um, when we get to the Moravians in North Carolina, since that's what I know the most about. It was based on this reputation of industriousness that John Carteret, the Earl of Granville and a proprietor of the Royal Province of North Carolina, encouraged the Moravians' interest in founding a settlement in North Carolina. 
The Englishman sold them 100,000 acres of land in Piedmont, North Carolina in 1752 that the Moravians called Der Wachau, or the anglicized word is Wachovia, um, after Zinzendorf's Austrian ancestral estate. The idea of settling in the backcountry of North Carolina appealed to the Moravians who wanted to establish communities where they could live as they pleased. The Moravians were constantly balancing their desire for trade with outsiders for economic benefit with their desire to isolate themselves to a certain extent to maintain a certain lifestyle, a lifestyle that differed from that of most of their American neighbors. The master plan for the North Carolina settlement included the eventual establishment of a central industrial trade town center, excuse me, trade or um, trade center in Wachovia. But the first Moravian settlers arriving in 1753 were more concerned with survival. The Moravians founded their first community, Bethabra, um, near an abandoned cabin. Bethabra means house of passage. They understood that this was to be a stepping stone toward the founding of their central congregation town. Progress was slow in the back country and um, the French and Indian War came in the meantime. And so they actually, um, Bethabra may continue to be their central town until um, <clears throat> about a, uh, 20 years later. It was not until 1765 that the need for the central town was brought to the forefront again and the site for the community was chosen. Construction of the town of Salem was begun in 1766. By April of 1772, much of the town of Salem had been completed and 120 people moved from Bethabra to Salem, leaving behind a small farming community. For the next several decades, Salem functioned as a congregation town in which the church was central to all spiritual, secular, and economic activities. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, similar to other Moravian communities, it was a communal society in which members were organized into groups or choirs according to age, gender, and marital status. The single sisters and single brothers each had their own large dwellings in which they lived and carried out their various businesses and trades. Although Moravians valued the traditional family unit, the choir system created other fellowship groups and alliances not found in other American communities. Although married church members owned their own family dwellings, trade shops, and cultivated their own gardens, the church owned the land and leased the lots on which the houses that they owned were built ensuring that the church leadership always had control over who could or could not live in the community. The church also owned and operated the major businesses and industrial pursuits of the community, including the tavern, the store, the tannery, the pottery, and the mill. In the 18th century, the church also enslaved the few African-American enslaved individuals within the community. Some of these people were put to work in businesses such as the tannery, where the chief operator was an enslaved man named Abraham, and others were rented to church members in town if they requested additional labor. With permission from church leadership, individual members of the church sometimes rented enslaved individuals from enslavers who were not Moravian, but the church strictly controlled the circumstances under which that was allowed. The number of enslaved individuals in Salem in the 18th century was small compared to other similar sized communities in the South. While the tightly controlled environment of the church governed North Carolina Moravian communities certainly placed many restrictions on the residents, it also provided a safety net for craftsmen and craftswomen who might have found it difficult to make it on their own. The church regulated competition among those practicing the various trades and supported these tradesmen by promoting trade outside of Salem. In colonial America, unmarried women had few options in most communities. The Single Sisters Choir House was a place where young unmarried women, and actually some older unmarried women, 
lived together, <clears throat> worshiped together, and supported themselves through their work in the glovery, their laundry, and the weavery, as well as other businesses. Many worked as domestics in other households. Unmarried Moravian women were afforded a sense of independence not often found in 18th century America. The physical organization of the community was intentional. As you can see on this slide, the four corners of the square were populated by the Gemeinhaus where 18th century Moravians worshiped and later the church on the Northwest corner. Diagonally across the square was the community store representing commerce. The Northeastern corner of the square was the location of the single brother's house and shop and on the southwest, excuse me, the southeastern, the, the northwestern corner was the single brother's house and the southeastern corner was um, the single sister's house. And no, there was not a tunnel that we know of that connected the two. And way on the outskirts of town was the 18th century tavern, which is the place that visitors to town stayed when they came to visit the trade shops and store. The distance from um, the center of town to the tavern is even more clear in this 18th century watercolor, although I'm, I think that the, um, my picture and the other two blocks on um, the right hand side are blocking out where the tavern is, but the center of town has the orange and, and green circles and the tavern, there are no buildings between the center of town and where the tavern is located. 18th and 19th century visitors to the Moravian town of Salem located in Piedmont, North Carolina, often remarked on the physical and cultural distinctiveness of this isolated backcountry community. Seen here in this um, late 18th century watercolor painting by school teacher Ludwig von Redeken. The industriousness of the residents, the operation of a pseudo guild system within the congregation town, and the deeply religious nature of the settlers fascinated outsiders who were allowed to visit and shop, but generally not live and work within the carefully controlled theocracy. When agriculturalist Elkanah Watson visited the town of Salem in 1786, just one year before this view of Salem was completed, he noted, quote, I entered the possession of the happy Moravians, so justly distinguished for their piety and industry. The moment I touched the boundary of the Moravians, I noticed a marked and most favorable change in the appearance of buildings and farms, and even the cattle seemed larger and in better condition. Here, in a combined and well-directed effort, all put shoulders to the wheel, which apparently moves on oily springs. In the possession of the Moravians, every lot looks neat and cheerful. The dwellings are tidy and well-furnished, abounding in plenty and adorned with that neat and simple elegance, which was a particular trait of these brethren. Now in the back country, the community of Salem, the settlement there really was outstanding in terms of how um, developed it was compared to other areas close by. The pursuit of piety and the desire to be left alone to live as they pleased was sometimes in conflict with the Moravian's desire to operate a profitable trading center to support church missions. Ultimately, the pursuit of piety and profit in equal measure required the constant attention of the church boards who carefully managed the secular side of community life with the same vigilance they applied to ensuring the spiritual health of residents. While the leadership was careful to make sure that outsiders like Elkanah Watson and others saw their community as a quote, well-ordered machine in which all brothers and sisters worked for the common good and got along without trouble, such was not always the case. Human nature was a regular visitor in God's garden. Dissent within the community was not unknown, but was swiftly managed. For example, a wage dispute in Salem in 1778 
among the single brothers caused great consternation when the youngest of the brothers, those who had just recently been admitted to the single, sister, the single brother's house, decided to ex essentially strike for higher wages. Quote, calmly walking away from their work. Some went to Bethabara and some to other places, end of quote. Church officials noted, quote, their godless intention had been to force a larger increase in their wages and to make the officials dance to their piping. The officials, however, were content to, quote, leave it to the savior to maintain their position against this audacious combination. I guess when God is your boss, <clears throat> it's a good idea not to question authority. Ultimately, the boys apologized and were warned to, quote, not allow Satan to deter them from the right path again. Moravians distinguish themselves from their neighbors, not only by their lifestyle, their planned communities, their buildings, and their theocratic approach to governance, but also in their outward appearance. At the Unity Synod held in Europe in 1775, quote, the craftsmen and especially the tailors were urged not to support the following of fashion. Quote, but when something of the kind was ordered from them to give notice of it, so that no fashionable clothing may be used among us. End of quote. All members of the community were to dress plainly according to community guidelines. In 1780, the church elders conference admonished those wishing to dress more lavishly by noting, quote, we took the opportunity to speak of the costly, unnecessary and striking clothing, which is making its appearance among our members and to remind them of the simple clothing which befits our calling. The 1787 minutes were more explicit in describing what was not acceptable. Quote, the letter regarding the lust for fashionable apparel has been considered. In the first place, it should be noted that the desire for fashionable dress is often a wish <clears throat> to wear something different, something new, to become noticeable and attract attention. Among such things are the big shaggy hats. Colors also come under the heading when they are chosen to strike the eye or when they are variegated or when clothing is adorned with silver or gilt or other shining buttons. And when coat and vest and breeches each has a conspicuous color. It is not improper to use a cane for walking if needed, but if one is used to attract attention, that shows the wrong spirit." End of quote. Although by the end of the first quarter of the 19th century, even the Moravians had succumbed to fashion, the clothing worn by women in particular was distinctive, especially in the 18th century, and differed in significant ways from that of their neighbors. Not only were women admonished to keep their clothing plain, they also wore simple caps on their heads known as hauben, tied with ribbons denoting their station in life. Red was for the youngest sisters, older sisters wore a darker red, Pink was worn by single sisters, girls and women over 18 who were unmarried. Blue was worn by married sisters and white was worn by widows. Even in the first quarter of the 19th century as acculturation inevitably led to a relaxing of clothing restrictions as you see in the last portrait on the right painted about 1825, many sisters continued to wear the colored ribbons denoting their choir and setting them apart from their neighbors. Perhaps not as striking a sign as descent, of dissent as a pussy hat would have been or a dissent collar. Um, <clears throat> I added these things just because I could and I hope I don't get struck by lightning before the end of this talk as a result of this. Although the decorative arts of the Moravians tend to be conservative, the church did not mandate plainness or dictate style. However, we do see the influence of the Moravian's descent, particularly in pottery. The progenitor of the North Carolina pottery tradition in North Carolina was Godfrey Doust, who apprenticed in Herrenhut, Germany, worked briefly in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and served as master in Bethabara before moving to Salem in 1771. 
His work and that of many of the potters he trained encompassed an astonishing range of ware, including slip decorated dishes like the ones you see here, British style creamware and faience, and sculptural bottle forms. Several of the pottery lines developed by the Moravians were purely commercial, but slipware had deep symbolic meaning within the community. The Moravian potters were masterful in their application of slip, which is the liquid clay used to decorate um, the dish surfaces. Most of the slip decorated dishes associated with Aust and his successors have naturalistic plants in their centers, making them analogous to flower paintings in clay. The most frequently depicted flowers on Moravian dishes are anemones, which often appear in conjunction with lilies of the valley, like you see here. And Christians have long associated anemones with Christ's sacrifice, believing them to be the flowers that sprung up from the ground as the blood flowed from his wounds. The flowers in the foreground of this anonymous crucifixion painting from Herrenhut suggest anemones held special significance for the Moravians who focused on Christ's blood and wounds more than other Protestants. Compelling evidence for the symbolic importance of anemones in Moravian art can be found in the work of artist John Valentine Height. This painting, Cornelius Foreseeing His Christianity, was probably owned by one of the Moravian congregations in North Carolina, and it depicts the Roman centurion Cornelius, who's considered to be the first Gentile converted to Christianity. And of course, Mary is holding the Christ child. Below the hem of Mary's robe are two white anemones draped over a book that probably represents the New Testament. In this context, the flowers represent the death of Christ to come, so they're white rather than red. Aust and his successors used strikingly similar floral compositions on their slipware dishes. The lilies on Moravian slipware may have been visual analogs for the marriage metaphor that was pervasive in early Moravian theology. The memoir of single sister Anna Rosina Anders, who died in 1803, describes the final moments of her life when she, quote, went gently and happy over to the arms of her beloved bridegroom. As a flower that blooms early in spring, the lily symbolizes both the advent of Christ and each believer's relationship to him. In the rustic mysticism of Jacob Bohem, who influenced Zinzendorf and other pietist theologians, lilies are also a symbol of God and the regenerated spirit of man. The blood and wounds theology so popular among the Moravians in the 18th century was not well received by Protestant Americans who considered it to be too Catholic for their liking. In fact, a letter in the Boston Weekly in 1742 likened the Moravians <clears throat> to foxes creeping into God's vineyard. So um, the blood and wounds theology really was a strike against them in terms of other um, Protestants. In her book, Material Christianity, social historian Colleen McDaniel has written that sacred objects or objects with sacred symbolism produced by and for distinct groups serve two functions. Not only do they bind the believer to the sacred, but they also bind the body of believers together. This is a provocative statement in view of the Moravians' constant battle to balance their need for trade with outsiders or strangers, as they called visitors to the community, with their desire to insulate themselves from the outside world. The flowers depicted on the slip decorated dishes, therefore, communicated messages about the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ to members of the Moravian congregation who understood this symbolism without inciting the suspicion of others who associated the blood and wounds theology with the Catholic church. Were the Moravians dissenters? Did they consider themselves to be dissenters? It's not a word they use to describe themselves or at least not that I can find in any of the records. But the 18th century material culture of the Moravians that we have looked at tonight certainly reflects the dissent 
their descent from popularly held practices and beliefs in, the, in 18th century America. When we look at the large dwellings occupied by choirs of unmarried men and women, clothing intended to eschew high, high fashion or pottery made to communicate spiritual messages through symbolism sacred to the members of the church, we're looking at material representations of the non-traditional lifestyle the Moravians chose to follow. We're looking at descent made material. Thank you. Now I'm going to unshare my screen so that we can talk about this a little bit. That was fantastic, Johanna, thank you. Thank you. We have a few questions. All right, well, I will try to answer them. Super, so one of, um, of our viewers has noted that the cultural trademarks that, uh, that the Moravians used are similar to some other religious groups from the 18th century. And this person is wondering what sort of relationship the Moravians had with the Quakers and Anabaptists. So started to talk about that a little bit with the two Catholic um, sort of thing, but, but can you go into that a little bit more deeply considering that there seem to be so many similarities? Right, there are a lot of similarities and the Moravians were certainly respectful of some of these other groups. In fact, very early in the history of the renewal of the Moravian church under the leadership of Zinzendorf, um, there were relationships. Zinzendorf was, was trying to serve as um, a sanctuary to different religious groups that were refugee religious groups. And in fact, for example, he tried to help settle the Schwenkfelders um, in Georgia. Ultimately, they went to Pennsylvania as well. Um, he, he did have a relationship with some of the other leaders um, in some of these other movements. Although I will say that, as you can imagine, many of these religious leaders had a bit of an ego. And so it was difficult for them to, uh, Zinzendorf would have liked for the Moravian church, the unity of the brethren to have encompassed all of these. But of course, everyone had their own ideas. And in many cases, um, he, they, they didn't come to blows, but there were disagreements among the leaders of some of these movements. And so, you know, there, there were um, different branches that continued rather than joining together. Fascinating, thank you. Um, and then thinking about, um, about their neat and simple elegance in architecture and the strictures against fashionable clothing, was there a theological reason for that? Or was it somehow that the social group just had norms that, that developed? No, there wasn't, there wasn't that I know of. There was, there was not a theological um, uh, me, feeling against it. And it wasn't like the Shakers where um, plainness was dictated for furnishings and everything else. Um, the idea was that they did not want to draw attention to themselves for how they looked by flashy clothing. They wanted to spread the word of God. And so your job was to spread the word of God, not show how fashionable you could be. Interesting. I noticed that not only um, did they seem not to be so fashionable, but in the images that you showed us, they were also much more modest in yes. their clothing choices than their contemporaries. Yes, yes. And that is much more true in America. There are, there are some images of Moravians in London, for example, where the clothing is a little bit more ostentatious, but um, the, the generally accepted idea was to work toward plainness. Now I will say by you know, the 1820s, the Moravians are becoming acculturated in many different ways. And fashion is one way um, that they are beginning to to buy into um, what they see around them, just the fashionable things they see around them. 
Well, you anticipated the next question. And that was that today, um, we don't seem to be able to tell from looking at someone whether that person is Moravian. Uh, so when did, when did that um, setting themselves apart really um, go away? The Moravians, from the time that they settle in America on forward, they are becoming American. And they, while they are, um, they're actually theologically Lutheran, philosophically Moravian in terms of the organization of their communities. Um, but by the middle of the 19th century, the first couple of generations of settlers are buying into this communal lifestyle because that is what keeps them afloat. And that is what enables them to build these incredible communities. But by the time you get to the second, third, fourth generations, people are saying, well, why can't I own the property that my house is on? I'm the one taking care of it. Why don't I get to own this property? A huge issue in the 19th century was the ownership and use of, of the enslaved. Um, early on, the Moravian church enslaved individuals that they rented to members of the church when needed. They were not huge proponents of slavery because they felt like it made um, their workers, particularly their young people, lazy. And so they were not huge proponents of slavery. But by the middle of the 19th century, the Moravians, again, are, are becoming more and more acculturated. They're seeing the community around them using the enslaved for economic purposes, and they begin to do the same thing, even though the church says, no, you can't do that, they do it anyway. And so you begin to see this sort of separation. Um, in 1856, that is when we see the church selling land to individual homeowners, and Salem becomes a small municipality that is no longer controlled by the church. It's no longer a theocracy. So it takes, it takes almost a hundred, well, over a hundred years, if you figure they came to North Carolina in 1753. And so by 1856, it, that is the amount of time it took to sort of break that up. Does that answer the question? I may have gone on. I may have, I may have rambled on that one. <laughs> I, I think that was great. Um, and then if we can turn to decorative arts a little bit and think about um, are there any markers besides the anemones, the, the slip decoration? Are there other, other things that, that we might notice if we were looking at 18th century Moravian decorative arts? Are there other um, styles or forms that set apart the Moravian decorative arts? Moravian decorative arts in the 18th century tend to be very conservative. So the Moravians who are settling in America are working in the styles that they that they were trained in in Europe. Um, but really, there are there are there is symbolism in um, other decorative arts, and I didn't really have time to get into it. There's a there's an amazing tree of life that um, is representative of all the different missions and congregations around the world that the Moravians had established by 1775, which is really an incredible visual um, to look at because, you know, the church was renewed in the 1720s and within 50 years it had grown tremendously. So there are works of art like that, that, that sort of represent what they're doing in terms of missions and um, spiritual activity. But in terms of furniture and things like that, it's they're more conservative. But but it but their their furniture, for example, does not form follows function. It, you know, a chair is a chair, a desk and bookcase is a desk and bookcase. They're not using inlay it symbol symbolically or anything like that. Okay, and so we've got another question then um, that's come in via Facebook about um, the declining. Um, the communities declining in size, and was that because the population, the numbers of people who were um, choosing to follow the Moravian faith declined, or was that more just the acculturation and assimilation into um, the American it's society? The, the number of Moravians didn't decline. It was it was their buy-in to this theocratic government that that declined, 
And so that that's really acculturation and wanting to be really moving toward being Moravian. I mean, I mean, being American, they were still Moravian in terms of, you know, still attending church regularly, um, you know, all of all of the um, the activities. So, I mean, many of these traditions still continue today in terms of the kinds of services and relationships and things like that. Um, but it was really acculturation into an American way of life. Great. And you mentioned both um, craftsmen and craftswomen. Are there any particular crafts that we really associate with Moravians? Well, we know that um, the single sisters were, they had a glovery. We don't have any extant examples of the gloves that they made, but we know that they had a glovery. We know they had a weavery. Beginning in the early 19th century, they also in North Carolina, in Pennsylvania, this started a little bit earlier, but they also um, operated a girls' school and taught um, various forms of fine needlework. And there is some evidence that they were selling needlework as well. So in terms of the women, those are the kinds of things that um, trades that the women are involved in. Um, the trades that the men are involved in are the, the same kinds of trades that you would expect to find in other, other communities. There were silversmiths, there were carpenters, there were joiners, cabinet makers, blacksmiths, all of those sorts of things. And Salem was really a, um, a trading center. So people came from all over the back country to shop in Salem and to, um, to buy goods there. Fantastic. Um, I think that that does it for questions. Do you have any last words that you want to share? We've all learned a tremendous amount. Not particularly. I, I will say that when I, when I first got the email about this, I thought the Moravians dissenters, they lived this nice quiet life and they, you know, they, they obeyed the rules and they did all, but, but the more that I thought about it and the more that I, um, looked into kind of the, the um, angle that you all were taking on this, I was like, well, yes, actually they were because they were living a lifestyle very distinct from what many Americans were living in the 18th century, particularly. Fantastic. Well, this has been great. Um, I hope everyone else has, um, has enjoyed the program as much as I have. And we hope that you'll join us next week um, for Barbara Brackman's talk, The Threads of Dissent, Anti-Slavery Needlework. So I hope to see you back next Thursday at seven o'clock. Um, in the meantime, you might also want to join us for our Collecting Rights program. You can find out more about that series on our website, www.gunstonhall.org. And we hope if you liked this program and you want to support this and other programs at Gunston Hall that you will consider donating to Gunston Hall and also to Old Salem and to Mesda. We work really hard to bring programs like this to you free of charge and we want to bring as many to you in the possible as many to you in the future as is possible. So we hope to see you again and um, we hope to um, again get um, any support from you in terms of donations and also uh, completing the evaluation that you can find a link to in the Facebook comments. So fill out that evaluation, let us know what you're interested in and what future programs we'd, you'd like to have from us. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.